Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. And shine within your people here. Joyous light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God's own face, you who sing creation's story, shine on every land and race. Now as evening falls around us, we shall raise our songs to you, God of daybreak, God of shine. Stars that grace the darkness in the blazing sun of dawn of the light of peace and wisdom, we can hear your quiet song. Love that fills the night with wonder, love that warms the weary soul, love that bursts all dreams asunder. Set us free and make us whole. You who meet the heaven splendor, every dancing star of night, make us shine with gentle justice. Let us each reflect your light. Mighty God of all creation, gentle cross. To lights of red, loving spirit of salvation, lead us on to endless day. May God be with you all, and also with you. Let us sing our thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Blessed are you, creator of the universe, from old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your grace make our darkness bright, for your word
prayers tonight come before you, O God, as incense. And may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Amen. From the second chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, he writes, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself. Emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of people. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Also from the second chapter, of the letter to the Hebrews. For it was fitting for him for whom all things and through whom all things in bringing many sons and daughters to glory to perfect the originator of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For this reason, he's not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. So that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For clearly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore in all things he he was made to be like his brothers so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. For since he was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of of those who are tempted. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. As we continue our series on the seventh story, you'll recall that in our parallel story, Corey the raccoon and his forest friends have experienced the price to be paid by bullying, by rebellion, by, by flight and, and materialism, and in the wake of all of those many strategies, than the temptation to just rehearse their powerlessness as victims, to make any difference whatsoever. And each of those attempts have, have left them feeling hollow and, and hopeless. And that is where we pick up the story today. As Tor- Corey and his friend, the owl, hung out by the bridge, another figure appears before them. Corey leaned over 
And he looked down into the clear water and saw a sad raccoon face looking back. And suddenly another face appeared. It was a large face with big brown eyes, a majestic creature that Cory had never seen before. What are you? Cory asked, still staring at the reflection in the water. Are you a monster? <laughs> I am a horse. My name is Swift. And with that, Swift Horse bent down to take a drink from the clear stream just inches away from Cory. And Cory's head slowly turned to take in the amazing creature, her pointed ears, her long, sleek neck, her tall shoulders, her strong legs, the wide back, and her coffee brown coat, her long and flowing black tail. I've never seen a horse before, Corey said. What is your story, Swift Horse? <laughs> I am a poet from far away. I travel the world seeking wisdom and beauty, and I share what I find in well-chosen words. I'm happy to meet you, Corey said. I need wisdom and beauty because I have a very big problem and the world feels very ugly to me right now. And Swift Horse lowered her head and she pointed her ears toward the young raccoon. Their noses were almost touching. Tell me, she said. My neighbors are living by stories that will only bring fighting and tears and trouble, Corey said. Then Corey told Swift Horse about Badger taking power and Fox and Weasel taking revenge, and Rabbit running away with some villagers and Old Skunk scaring away other villagers. Porcupine and the baggy gray coats and the rise of the shiny object factory and all of Corey's sad neighbors who felt that life was just so unfair. And for a long time, Swift Horse listened to Corey, breathing in long, slow breaths. And when Corey finished speaking, Owl called out from the tree above them, and you know what she said. Who, who, who will help me? Maybe it's time for you to look within for the help you need. I have a plan. Climb on my back and I will explain. And Cory scampered up the tree and dropped onto Swift Horse's back. And Owl joined Cory there, and as they trotted along, Swift Horse shared her plan. And then, when they reached the village square, a crowd quickly gathered because no one had ever seen a, a creature so large and so beautiful as Swift Horse before. Let's have a special meal in honor of our special guest, Corey said. Let's set up a big round table and let's all bring our, our favorite food to share. But please, everyone, please leave your shiny objects at home. And while their neighbors prepared a special meal, Corey and Owl rode Swift Horse out into the deep forest. There they found turtle and lizard and snake and frog, and they invited them back home again. And as the sun was setting, they returned to the old village, riding on swift horses back. And they saw the big round table, table full of delicious food, and Cory gave the furless, featherless neighbors the places of the greatest honor, right next to swift horse. Then Cory asked everyone to take off their baggy gray coats so Swift Horse could see their, their beautiful, wonderful differences. And as they ate their meal, Corey's neighbors told their stories, stories from their own lives, and stories from the long ago days of their ancestors, stories of, of hope and, and joy, stories of pain and sorrow, and Swift Horse listened very carefully to every word. And after the meal, Corey turned to Swift Horse and said, would you recite one of your poems for us? And she nodded her head. And she shook her mane. And she looked at each guest with her big brown eyes and began to speak, her gentle voice sounding like a song. <laughs> six old stories wherever I go, the same six stories are running the show. The power to dominate, the story of striking back with fury and hate, the story of running to find a safe place or pointing at others to shame and disgrace, 
or being stuck in self-pity for the pain we've been through, or of me having more shiny objects than you. These same six old stories steal freedom and laughter, so nobody lives happily ever after. But, but Swift Horse began walking around the table as she continued her, her poem, her hooves clip-clopping to the rhythm of her words. There's a new seventh story to live by, my friends. A new seventh story without us against them. Of working for fairness in all that we do. Of refusing to strike back when others strike you. Of facing our problems and not running to hide. Of not letting differences make us divide. Of turning our pain into compassion for others of not wanting more than our sisters and brothers. The new seventh story that I'm speaking of is the story of peace. And the hero is love. And for a long time, there was only the sound of the wind in the trees and swift horse's hooves as she circled the big round table. And Swift Horse stopped walking and she spoke again. <laughs> My friends, the most wonderful story in the universe is the story of love growing and spreading from one heart to another. We all get to play a part in this story. There is no big or small, no short or tall, no best or worst, no blessed or cursed, no dirty or clean, no cause to be mean, no rich or poor, no reason for war. We have more than enough of the story of love. Each is for all of us, and all are for each of us. This is the wisdom the new story teaches us. And eyes blinked and opened wide, and ears perked up, and tails twitched, brows furrowed, and feathers ruffled. And all around the table, faces looked surprised and curious, and smiles began to form on many faces, and Swift Horse raised her head and let out a loud whinny that echoed through the streets. And nobody had ever heard about a seventh story before. It sounded beautiful and, and wise to just about everyone, except for Badger and Fox and Weasel and Skunk. All at once, they started growling and snarling, growling and snarling. No, stop, be quiet. You're hurting our ears with your words. Go back where you came from. We like ruling over others by tooth and by claw. We like wearing our baggy gray coats. And most of all, we are making more and more money by selling more and more shiny objects. We will never, ever, ever have enough. And we will never, ever, ever live by your silly seventh story. Go away and never come back, you Big, ugly donkey! Badger and Fox and Weasel and Skunk started throwing leftover food at Swift Horse, and, and they threw their plates and their silverware too, and they snarled terrible, awful words at her. And she began walking away, and then turned back, her eyes so sad, yet so full of love. And in her gentle, and yet strong voice, she said, <laughs> Drive the poet away, but this story will stay. Long after I'm gone, the story lives on. And her words only made them more angry yet. And yet they jumped up then from the table, they ran toward her, they snapped at her legs, they drove her out of the village, over the broad meadow, to the edge of the clear stream near the deep forest, snarling 
and growling and snapping all the way. You know, whenever we feel threatened or often even just challenged in one way, shape, or form, one of our really natural human tendencies is to see ourselves only as the victims of that challenge, no matter what form it takes. And thus, again, to want to eliminate what we perceive to be as that particular threat. Cries of a canceled culture are a reflection of this when a majority, again, perceives others as imminent threat to their legitimacy. The impulse to eliminate is what happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. It's what happened to the horse, swift horse, in our story here today and to the victims of those recent shootings in Atlanta and in Boulder, whom we grieve deeply again today. And as we know, it's also what happened to Jesus. I also dare say that's what happens whenever I use my ability or my authority to silence or diminish other voices trying hard to be heard, whether it's at a meeting at, at church or school or anywhere for that matter. It's what happens when I prevent someone from expressing their, their civil right to vote or participate fully in public life that we share together. It's what happens when I play on stereotypes to justify not accepting my own responsibility or just the temptation to scapegoat, to blame, to make it just miserable for someone else to feel fully welcomed or accepted or valued truly as a neighbor. As Luther noted long ago in his explanation to the, the Ten Commandments, the ways in which we can kill each other are myriad, and they go far beyond just the literal examples. An alternate way of, of being, a, a different seventh possible story by which to, to guide our own lives, our decisions, our values, is, is lived by Jesus, who, again, instead of of focusing on dominance or, or isolation or powerlessness of any of the many ways in which elimination takes place, he chose instead, Scripture says, to empty himself, in the words of Philippians, to literally choose to get off of that game entirely, to be the scapegoat himself, so that that tendency, that temptation was no longer necessary. He chose that, that we might choose a different focus for our lives. One that, that eliminates them by eagerly welcoming them as one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness, the darkness has, has not, not overcome it. it. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You shall bear a child, and his name shall be Jesus. The chosen one of God most high. And Mary said, I am the servant of my God. I lead to your will. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices. Holy One, strong is your kindness, 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise the thanks to you. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be. 